Welcome to the Team Made Apart podcast, the podcast designed to teach freelancers, contractors, and remote workers, really anyone working apart, how to build better relationships with those they work with and those they work for. I'm your host, Ryan Rogar. Before we get started, financial support for the Team Made Apart podcast is provided by R2, a fully distributed brand relationship consultancy. R2 has specific expertise and experience in helping service companies grow, develop, and maintain impactful relationships through world-class brand strategy and design. R2 supports the world's best distributed companies by providing valuable insights, strategy, empathy, and tactical expertise to help them foster truly meaningful relationships from top management to top consumer. If the success of your business depends on the relationships you make, then you need R2. To learn more or to request a call, simply visit r2mg.com slash podcast. That's r2mg.com slash podcast. R2, relationships squared. Also, financial support comes from teammateapart.com. Leveraging 20 plus years of global agency and creative hiring expertise, Teammate Apart provides distributed organizations with access to the best and brightest creative talent from around the world. Through deep understanding of client needs and meaningful relationships with talent, Teammate Apart facilitates a sort of virtual handshake between prospective employer and prospective employee to reduce risk and eliminate doubt from creative hiring decisions. Take a step towards filling that creative-shaped void in your distributed team by visiting teammateapart.com slash talent. That's teammateapart.com slash talent to learn more. Finally, financial support comes from supporters like you. Members of our happy little podcast community can make contributions directly to the show by visiting teammateapart.com slash podcast and clicking on the donation link. Donations can be made in any amount and would go a long way towards keeping this show on the air. If you appreciate the work we're doing and would like to get involved, just visit teammateapart.com slash podcast, click the donate button, and you're on your way. Thanks in advance for your continued support. And now, on to the show. Hey there, and welcome to the season three finale of the Team Made Apart podcast. I just wanted to take a quick moment and thank everyone who's participated in the show this season, both guests and listeners who've been willing to share the good work we're doing here with their friends, families, professional networks, and hopefully anyone who could benefit from the perspectives and knowledge shared by our contributors. Hot off the heels of COVID, I think that this show and others like it, and the individuals who've joined us here to share their great wells of knowledge have done a real service to a world experiencing drastic change and I am thrilled to add the voice of today's guest to the soapbox from which we've been shouting. Today's special guest is the incredible John Reardon. John is the director of support at Shopify, chairman at Grow Remote, and a figure with a well-documented history of making impactful contributions to the world of remote work. John's prior employers are a veritable who's who of progressive companies with whom he's been wildly influential on their integration of remote work strategies. From US Airways to Virgin Atlantic to Apple and now Shopify, His experience as a results-oriented international customer service leader have proven invaluable in showing how remote work works at scale. John joins us today for a much-needed and much-anticipated conversation about intentionality and how it can make or break a company's approach to remote work, developing a culture of trust on distributed teams, how the role of remote team leaders have evolved rapidly in recent years, and so much more. Please join me in welcoming to the show our guest, John Reardon. Hey, John, how are you? Hey, Ryan. How are you doing? Very well. Grateful to uh, have you here. As I mentioned in the introduction, this is much anticipated conversation. I think uh, we've been going back and forth for maybe a little over a year at this point, trying to make this happen. And uh, so I am, I'm just thrilled to death to have you here and very grateful for it. Uh, apologies that it's taken so long to, to get to here, but let's make the most of it. Absolutely. Well, first things first, I've been trying to get in the habit. I'm getting about a 50% rate, uh, uh, rate of return on this, but um, where are you calling in from today? Um, I'm usually based in Cork in Ireland, which is on the south coast of Ireland, but uh, I'm fortunate enough that I have access to, uh, my my mother has a summer house right out on the edge of the Atlantic, um, overlooking, um, basically overlooking the Atlantic with a beautiful uh, beach view, and I happen to be there, happen to be here at the moment um, for a couple of weeks. Uh, One of the upsides or downsides, whichever way you look at it, the pandemic is working remote and the ability to you know in my particular case i'm trying to stay away from 
folks and not catch the virus. So I've been quote unquote sent here by my wife to look after myself. It's been a really tough, just myself, the dog, um, a couple of crates of beer and a laptop and a beautiful view. So it has not exactly been the greatest hardship in the world. Well, I will say what I love about it is that, uh, you know, you're doing the the sort of stereotypical nomad thing, right? You're on the beach working, you know, like everybody sees in the pictures, but I don't know that you want to have your toes in that Irish sand right now. I, I don't know what the weather's like over there. I'm sure it's a beautiful view, but I don't know if it's that tropical beach, everyone. Uh, uh, no, it looks really good, but it would be, uh, yeah, a little bit of frostbite. <laughs> I love that. Well, hey, let's, I guess, sort of begin at the beginning a little bit. I mean, obviously, you have a long history in working remote. I mean, you're a well known figure in the space, but I want to, I don't, so I don't want to, you know, beat too much on the history of how, you know, we got from A to B. But if, if you don't mind giving us sort of an abridged version of sort of your history and how you sort of evolved into working in remote, uh, with, with remote work at all. Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of happened by chance. It was around, I think it was 2000, just after 9-11. Uh, so it was late 2001. Um, I was with Virgin Atlantic and we had a significant challenge ahead of us, which was stripping out about 25% of the cost structure of the company, as all airlines were at the time. And one of the single biggest personnel costs was um, the support organization. Now, what your listeners need to recognize and understand was that uh, a lot of the calls that were taking place in airline support in, in those days were really no value calls. At the time, they were there was a, a seemingly perceived value. But when you look at it from today's viewpoint, you can understand how they were of no value. They were um, seat assignments, uh, meals, um, reconfirming flights, uh, all sorts of, of, of really crappy um, non-revenue uh, additional calls. So one of our challenges was, was how do we actually take those out of the network and out of the system and actually do it cheaper? I happened to be at uh, an event and I overheard someone talking about remote work, got involved in the conversation. And as I was driving home that night, um, having kind of laughed off this remote work, because you know, it'll never work type of thing. You know, the classics, the class, I, I, I was the classic sort of, um, doubting Thomas. And as I was driving home that night, um, I, was, I was in, uh, I was driving back from Boston to Connecticut. And I thought, hang on a second, there's something to, there, there, there's something nagging me. This is, this sounds really clever, really interesting. By the time I got home, I was really curious. I ended up contacting the company that was referenced in the call, in, in the conversation. And over the course of the next six months, I kept on trying to find, I was really, I was trying to find the catch. I want, and I kept on saying to the sales guy, what's the catch? And I couldn't find a catch. And the real gotcha for me was when I went and actually participated in one of the online training classes. And I saw how well the folks were being trained. So we ended up at Virgin Atlantic outsourcing um, our, con our customer support organization to a company that was using remote workers as a trial. The, but the trial was wildly successful. And that sort of whetted my appetite of, uh, on remote work, rolled the clock forward two or three, actually about four years. And um, a little company in Cupertino in California, Apple, was planning a couple of years in advance for the rollout of the iPhone and was looking to see, looking for a scalable customer support model. Remote work was on the horizon. They weren't quite sure how to do it. Uh, my name was, was was surfaced at Apple. I ended up getting a phone call. They asked me if I'd like to talk to them. So I did. And I took a gamble and went and worked um, on a contract basis for Apple. And the very first remote call by an Apple, by an agent working for Apple was about uh, 13 months before the iPhone launch. So that's the level of prep that Apple was doing at that stage. I didn't even know what we were prepping for. I knew it was something interesting. And uh, so Apple launched it. So that was in May 2006. And if you think of it now, 15 years later, Apple probably has worldwide about 25, 30,000 is my guess, um, folks who work from home, be it as employees of the company or with their outsourced partners. So from that uh, tiny little acorn, a very large oak tree grew. 
Yeah, I love that. Well, and I think it's really interesting too, because I mean, you sort of progressed through a time, you know, this is the way I always describe my career and my relationship, like with the internet and stuff is that in the early days of my youth, in order to be online, you had to learn how to program, right? You learned a little bit of coding and stuff like that, because if you wanted to be online, that's how it was done. And uh, so I had the opportunity to sort of, you know, bridge the gap between, you know, drag and drop solutions we have today and back, you know, back in the olden days of actually hard coding everything. You are sort of explaining that same transition, but as it pertains to remote work, you know, obviously there've been iterations of remote work, you know, almost as long as we've had the internet, but this idea of it becoming sort of mainstream and part of what we do, you know, as part of our daily routine, uh, you know, certainly been a transition. So it's, it's really cool to hear you sort of recount all those steps along the way. One of the, sorry, one, one other fun, fun thing about that was um, when I was doing the investigative investigative work in, I think this would have been 2003, 2002, 2003, um, it was called telecommuting. It wasn't remote work. And it's such, when you think of it, it's such an <laughs> antediluvian dinosaur expression, telecommuting. Yeah. But that's what it was. And there was actually a national telecommuters, national telecommute, telecommuting association. Oh, how funny. Yeah, no, I think that that was one of those indicators of the future back, you know, 20, 30 years ago was when you could mush words together like that and make these little hybrids that sounded technologically advanced. So I think that that was the move then, but, uh, but I just love that. So one of the things that's sort of resonating with me or popping out of this conversation, though, is you're talking about the different things that the organizations were doing, and especially in your uh, memory of, of working with Apple, they were super intentional about the kind of work that they were doing. You know, this was something that they were putting serious thought in, serious dollars behind, serious money into. And, you know, obviously they're hoping to, to be efficient and save money down the road and, you know, get a return on this. But, but nonetheless, they're being wildly intentional about it. And I know that this, you know, right now during sort of where we're, for most of us, we're coming off sort of the heels of COVID. Hopefully most people are starting to get back to some semblance of what it was to be, I guess, normal, quote unquote, normal. And, um, you know, so I, I'm thinking that there are so many companies that were forced to go remote during this period of, of sort of turmoil during the pandemic that maybe they didn't have the opportunity to be intentional. And I'm afraid that that might have led to some bad experiences with remote work. So I wonder if you just talk a little bit about sort of, you know, how important, you know, intentionality is in, in setting up a remote workforce. First of all, I don't even know if it's a word, but we will go with the word intentionality. <laughs> um, I, but uh, we, we leave it at that. It's, it, it's, a, it's a word I'm, that gets it's oft used, whether it's a word or not. Um, I'm a notorious maker upper of words. So, uh, so I'll take it either way. I, you're, there you go. You're a maker upper <laughs> of, of intentionality, words like intentionality. Um, yeah, it's a really, really interesting one, Ryan, because um, companies who are working from home right now, the vast majority of them did not set out to do this intentionally. And what I would urge people to recognize is that what they're experiencing right now is survival in a pandemic and trying to work from home, juggling um, care, juggling education, juggling um, a pretty crappy home office setup in a lot of instances. That is not intentional working from home. If you set out to intentionally work from home, you're gonna have a really strong professional home office setup. And that's very different. And I, I would urge people to, to uh, those people who have been, let's say forced out of the office to work from home, um, split into two groups, one who've really enjoyed it and the second group who haven't. So let's say the folks who've really enjoyed it, please understand that the, you're, you're enjoying the output and you're enjoying a lot of the benefits of it, but it can get a whole hell of a lot better when you add levels of intentionality to it. For those people who haven't enjoyed it and haven't really um, seen the proper experience, I would urge them to actually look at how it can be done intentionally and don't rush to judge until you've actually been in a fully intentional work from home scenario. Now, I do also want to recognize that working from home or working remotely is not for everybody and it's not for every industry. So, you know, some people try to make this a black and white issue. It isn't. And we're going to see a significant migration back into offices. 
we're going to see companies, and we always see this, Ryan, with a pendulum swing, right? When, when everybody says, oh, we're all going to work from home, a smart company out there will hang their shingle out and say, oh, no, we're going to be office-based so that they can actually attract a rich seam of talent of people who are, who are deliberately saying, I absolutely want to work in an office. So you've got to understand that pendulum swing, but let's talk about this big body in the middle. There's a large group of people who've seen the benefits of working from home. And those people are going to be the ones who are going to decide what level the future of homework will be. Will it be, you know, a three day a week? Will it be, you know, that, that they, I know it's a, a much overused word, the hybrid model, but what level of a hybrid model will exist in the future? My personal opinion is that uh, the, the genie is out of the bottle. The outcome and the output of people working from home can never be, we, no leader is ever going to be able to say it can't work and it doesn't work. So I'm never going to, um, I'm never going to let it be, that idea be floated again. Because after all, a lot of people have spent 12, 13, 14 months working from home and a lot of bus most businesses have stayed open, so it, it actually has worked. So it's going to be so fascinating to see which way the pendulum swings. It's not going to be it's not going to be all the way towards remote, but nor is it going to be all the way towards towards um, towards office. I do think somewhere in the middle, but I think like I, I'll go back to the comment: the genie is out of the bottle. We know it works, and it's going to be very interesting which side of the fifty percent, which side of the halfway line it's going to actually. Uh, it's going to land. Yeah, I think you make a great point there. And I, I love sort of pointing out this fact about, you know, this not being a black and white situation, right? I think, especially when you talk about intention, I think the the impulse is to think that you're being intentional for remote, right? You're being intentional for remote, but your intention could be remote doesn't work for me and I'd be, I prefer to be in the office. And so, I mean, you can be intentional in one way or the other. It doesn't mean necessarily take this side. And I think that there is sort of this misnomer out there among sort of, I, I guess what you would call remote work advocates, this idea that it must be all one way, the future of work is remote and blah, blah, blah. But I think most people actually are more aligned with what you're talking about, sort of this hybrid model or what, you know, what people might call flexible work. And it's more about getting, you know, great output from your people and giving them the best opportunity to provide that output versus, you know, saying you must work from an office, even if you're underperforming. So I think, uh, I think it's really good to talk about that sort of, you know, gray area that's uh, in yeah. the middle there. Absolutely. And I look at the end of the day, it's exactly what it is. It's a gray area and it would be a very brave person that will plant a flag and say, I absolutely know what's going to happen in the future. You don't. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's see how it transpires but I, you know like I, i'll keep on going back to the point the genie is out of the bottle we know it works and how it will develop into a into the let's call it the the future work palette is going to be fascinating and i'll be quite bullish on it and say it's going to be a significant piece of the future but it's not everything yeah. Well, and I think that there is that distinction too, right? Between people who were in a work from home situation, you know, basically forced by COVID or forced by pandemic to work from home versus sort of the intentional or the remote worker by choice. And I think that there's a significant difference there also for leaders and for people who are running companies, right? I mean, you, you know, were put in a situation as a leader, maybe where all of a sudden you had to you know, figure out how to make everybody work from home and you bought whatever software or technology you seem to think you might need to, you know, hurry up and get a bandaid over this, you know, gaping wound. But the, you know, reality of the situation is now things have settled. We seem to have a little bit more bearing. I mean, of course, it's still wildly unknown what, you know, what the future holds, but, you know, we, we feel to at least have our bearings back a little bit. We sort of know which way is north and we can start maybe directing our company again. And I think it would be foolish to sort of just out of hand say, okay, well, remote work doesn't work. We tried it and it sucked. You know, because I think the reality is, you know, you were put in a weird pickle. This idea that work from home is remote work is not, you know, they're not congruent. And so I think, you know, as it pertains also to intention, you know, this idea for or for leaders of either presently co-located teams who are looking to have remote work or people who are looking to go hybrid and sort of, you know, fulfill the wishes of those who wish to stay remote, uh, you know, those kinds of people, you know, this level of intention is more than just at the level of the worker. It's, you know, at the level of the employer, you know, how do we build a better company? How do we make better opportunity for our people, all that thing? And how do we do that with intention? What I would say to pretty much everybody is don't, don't go for the absolute, all right? 
don't say it's abs this is the, the, the panacea, but I don't want it to be dismissed either. It really is, um, it's interesting because, the, you know, I, I'll give you a, a really simple example. It, it, it irks me when I hear people say, um, you know, the only way, you know, and I, you hear, you, it, this is, tends to be how it's phrased, is the only way that people are going to understand a company culture is when they're intent, when they're in a room together collaborating. Well, that's really interesting. So tell that to, and you could list off a hundred companies, a couple hundred companies worldwide who have started just since the pandemic, who have built a remote worldwide organization, plus many others who've been doing it for the last, you know, eight, 10, 12 years. You can't tell them that they don't have a company culture. But what these people are actually saying is, I don't have it in my wheelhouse to understand how I could replicate the culture that I grew up in, I don't know how to replicate that in a remote world. So that so how they phrase it is it doesn't work or it can't work. And what really they need to be, people need to be a lot more honest and say, I'm not sure how this could work, but I'm going to lean in and go and find out, is it possible that it could work? That is the magic. And if people will actually lean in and find that out, and, 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 and reach out to people who've got expertise in this and be curious. I think it's gonna be a very interesting development over the next five years. Yeah, it's one of the things I've been saying, you know, during this crisis is that we're really going to see, especially as it pertains to remote work, you're really going to see where great leaders lie, right? You're going to find out who's good and who's bad, because, you know, you're going to have situations like this, where people are just dug in that this is how it's going to be. We've always done it this way. This is how it must be, you know, race back to the office as soon as we can get there. You know, that kind of, uh, I guess, sort of, you know, not very pliable thinking. Uh, versus, you know, the leaders who are a little bit more adaptable, who are curious and learning the new situations, you know, how, how do we grow? How do we adapt? You know, and I'll stop beating the, the horse with the word intention. You know, it's actually become a bit of a drinking game on the show this year uh, because we've said it so often. But a big part of remote leadership is being intentional. And I think part of being intentional is being open to new ideas, right? I mean, it's, it's exactly what you were just saying is that if you hope to lead a team that is either distributed now or might be in the future, even partially, you know, setting yourself up with the intention of you know, not only serving them better, but all the things that come with being intentional in your work, you know, de developing greater levels of trust and, you know, more transparency and, and all these things that are the, the sort of the buzzy terms for remote leaders, you know, it, I mean, it ultimately makes you a better leader, whether you're co-located or not, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great thing for people. Another, another way to look at it is, is um, as a leader, it's probably the most challenging thing is a cataclysmic change like this a massive, um, you know, tectonic plate shift of a change that happened pretty much overnight without much um, advance warning. And the challenge is I've got to change how I operate as a leader. And there are people who will struggle to do, will struggle to adapt. And there are people who will do it so seamlessly. And I think every organization needs to recognize that it doesn't make somebody a great leader if they're able to change like overnight, but it doesn't necessarily make somebody a bad leader if they're struggling with the change. And I think organizations need to be empathetic and help their leaders along that learning curve so that they understand that, you know, look, it's, it's like everything, change is difficult. You, it's very difficult to tell somebody, you know, who's been a leader for 25 years and where their domain is standing up from their desk and looking out at the people that work for them and, and they're able to, you know, there's an element of command and control there. How do I take the things that I need to get done and get it done in a different way that's not sort of that command and control um, presenteeism or not presenteeism, but the, the, my, let's say, um, imposing my presence upon those in front of me. How do I do that? through a small little screen like this and do it um, maybe not um, by speaking, but maybe doing it through asynchronous communication. That's a huge change for people. And it's important that organizations give their leaders a chance to actually adapt. 
So you, you training organizations are going to need to change that skill set because there's no point in throwing out, you know, uh, you know, throwing out a, a whole um, layer of leadership. No, that's that's not that's not the issue. It's how do you work with your leadership team to get them to adapt to these new circumstances? That's a huge challenge for every org. Yeah, you know, one of the things too that I've been uh, sort of espousing during this whole period is that you know. Basically, everybody has experienced trauma now. You know, we're all recoverers. You know, we're all recovering from the trauma of COVID. You know, whether you lost people or whether you were just strictly tied up in your house or whatever. So I hear all these people shouting about the new normal and get back to normal and all that stuff. And I think it does a real disservice to people who have suffered, right? I mean, basically everybody who's coming back to work is now a trauma a victim. And so I think that, you know, maybe now more than ever, these levels of trust and empathy and things like that are becoming more and more important. And so I wonder if we can maybe transition our conversation a little bit to just talking about that trust and how we can really go forward in developing a deep trust, you know, with teams that we're working with remotely. Look, tr trust is the absolute and utter oil in the engine. If it isn't there, um, if it isn't there, the 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 company's not the the division, the department, the company is not going to be able to to work remotely. Um, pure and simple. So I always say to people, remember the time when you sat in a, in an office and you passed over the contract to the person when you were hiring them. The feeling that you had that this is the right person coming in, you trusted them completely. Now, mind you, in the old days, we then tended to be quite um, pedantic and quite prescriptive as to what we needed people to do because they were right in front of us and they might run into the office and you tell them what to do. In the virtual world, in the remote world, it's quite different. It's really a case of trusting somebody to do the work handing out the work assignment and you know there's a bit of give and take in that and the work comes back and it becomes output based as opposed to um let's say somebody being able to tell you that they're doing the work it's really a case of is the work done or not and that's a very very simple uh, it's a, it's, a t it's such a tiny thing but those folks who have worked in an office and are now working remote will will i think will get the point it's not about telling your boss that you're oh it, it's nearly done it kind of is or it isn't mm -hmm. and there's a level of bs i think that's 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 been stripped away by the the communication methods that we're using right now so to me it's a slightly purer form um and i think it's more output based and that's where like organizations that are that are able to really double down on trust are getting the rewards very, very quickly because they're actually trusting their employees. Look, it, there's a very simple, anybody who's read um, Daniel Pink, there's a really interesting um, piece on um, in the book Drive. And he talks about the three most, most important intrinsic motivators are autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And once you give people a level of autonomy, which is essentially where, where trust is, is, is massively important, you enable them to master their craft and you set them up with the purpose of the company or the division you're going to get you're going to get the, the most the, you're going to get the greatest level of value from somebody because you will actually tap into that intrinsic drive that people have so really it is all about autonomy but autonomy is the foundation of autonomy is trust you must trust that people will get the job done yeah, I think that's right. And I would say too, even as an extension of this, you know, the, like maybe the two way street version of trust is this idea of psychological safety. And it's this idea of building an environment that not only do I trust you, my employer, you trust me, the employee, but we have this sort of two way conversation where we're free to make comments and we're free to talk and we've cultivated this culture that allows this two way conversation and we feel safe doing it. You know, I, I've, I mean, myself, I've worked in situations where, you know, it doesn't feel particularly safe to say what's on top of your mind. Right. And I mean, maybe, you know, we need to have a little, you know, mm -hmm. a little self-control and not go too nuts and say everything that comes to mind. But at the same time, um, I, I think being in an operation or in an environment where you have this, I guess, sort of built in security where you don't feel like you're going to be run off at any given time, certainly could contribute to trust, if not, maybe is sort of the, uh, you know, the whole thing. Well, I think the, I'm going to say exactly what you said in a slightly different way. 
um, the, the counterbalancing element for trust is vulnerability. And if you as a leader are willing to show a level of vulnerability, you're actually doubling down on the trust, right? Because um, you have to have that, it's a, it's a little bit of a give and take. Um, if you only will, tr if you trust people, but you, you maintain the kind of command and control vision of the world where I'm omnipotent and I'm always right, uh, that's not really setting a proper trusting environment. Telling people that you absolutely screwed up or that you're having an absolutely crappy day um, might not have been in your wheelhouse five years ago in an office-based world. But once, you've, once you're suddenly in this remote world and you're dealing with people in a very different way, I, I think it comes a lot more naturally to, pe to people to actually counterbalance that trust with vulnerability and be a lot more open. Um, I've, I've seen it happen in the last two organizations that I've been in from a remote perspective, that, that vulnerability is the perfect counterweight for trust. Yeah. Well, and I think that's right. I think vulnerability too. And, and for many, maybe they're going to misconstrue this idea of being vulnerable in meaning that you must, you know, air your dirty laundry in the room or whatever. But, um, but ultimately what we're talking about is being, uh, you know, open and honest in conversation and in, in practice, you know, I mean, you see, especially, you know, is more common in remote companies, it seems than in, in other types, but I mean, you see, often see, you know, uh, it, payroll is, is out in the open and, you know, all our documentation is out in the open and all our, you know, meetings and everything like there's no secrets we're not hiding things and you know that's an example of being vulnerable quote unquote vulnerable in that you're sort of pulling back the curtain and letting people see what's going on even if it doesn't necessarily mean an emotional vulnerability but to your point i think that the emotional bit you know too being able to just sort of express your humanness among other humans is you know critical in developing not just good work relationships but relationships in general you know re human relationships well, there's one aspect of this as well that 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 kind of goes without saying, and it's it's an adjunct to the point you just made, which is, uh, and it's kind of leading on to the next topic, which is leadership. Is is um, if you're not looking after yourself first, and for example, um, you know the, the the classic airline thing about putting your oxygen your own oxygen mask on first, right? If you're not looking after yourself first, you're not able to help everybody else. But to actually explain to people what you're doing and that you are actually, hang on, I am now, like metaphorically speaking, I am putting on the oxygen mask so that I can help you guys. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a really strong symbol of, of, um, of, of trust. And you know, I think it's, it's, it's one of the most important things from a leadership perspective uh, is the trust, the vulnerability, and um, the trans I think you, you referenced it there, the transparency, you put all those together and you're actually, you're now, we're now building up that leadership palette in a far stronger way. Yeah. We always use the examples of, you know, sort of, I mean, being willing to show your belly, you know, sort of evolutionarily speaking, you know, was, was a, a sign of being vulnerable. And then this concept of sort of breaking bread, right? You hear this old phrase breaking bread, you know, but the idea is that you're, you know, basically proving to the, your counterpart that you're not going to poison them, right? You're being vulnerable, you're being open. And I think that that is critical of leaders. And, uh, and so maybe as you, you alluded to it sort of segues nicely into this conversation about how, how remote leadership has changed. I mean, obviously, you know, people have been doing this for a long time. There are a number of companies that are doing it rather successfully at this moment, but, you know, obviously there is a lot of stuff happening in our world right now? I mean, what do, what do you, I guess, if you had a, a finger up in the air and you were testing the winds, you know, how do you see things moving around and how is, how is leadership evolving in remote agencies? It's revolve, it, it's evolving slowly. Um, you know, I, I think we, we saw a sudden knee jerk reaction to it. And there, like as I referenced earlier on, some people jumped into it very quickly and made a very strong, uh, uh, made a really, really good effort to learn as much as they could as quickly as possible to try to get the, you know, the quick sprint into it. Some folks are more of the middle distance runner. They're going to take their time to get it. And then some of the long distance ones are going to take a long time um, to really, truly evolve. And that's okay. So as a, as, a, as a senior leader in a company, you've got to understand that people will come to the pace of this remote work at a very different um, at very different speeds, and that is okay. 
and you have to evolve your leadership style based upon people's um, uh, speed of acceptance and speed of, of recognition of that. So, that, you know, I think that's the first thing is, is the acceptance of reality. This is not a magic switch that you can just run around. I'm going to switch. I'm going to turn the on off button on the back of everybody. And now they're suddenly available and they're, they're, they're now totally different people. And they're now, they've, they've gone from being unwoke to being woke. No, no, it just doesn't, it, it just simply just doesn't work like that. Um, so from a leadership perspective, to me, that's the, that's the most important thing. Um, and then I'm just going to reiterate the points. I know to, to, to bore the pants off you, I'm going to reiterate the points of, of trust. And the other one I'm going to add in is to, com is the communication. Doubling down on communication is probably the most important thing that people will need to do from a leadership perspective. Um, now I'm going to actually bifurcate the communication thing for a second. What some people hear when they hear communication, how it translates to them is I need to be on zoom calls seven or eight hours a day. I need to be constantly communicating with my people. No, no, you can't do that. You will absolutely fry your brain if you are nonstop seven, eight, nine hours a day on Zoom calls. You, do, you don't have the time to get the work done, right? And I think from a communication perspective, to me, the most important part of communication is to have a couple of gaps during the day, intentional spaces in the day where you're able to get a few things done and you tell people openly transparently you know i'm i'm you know i do it myself i have at the end of the, the last half hour of every morning it's when i catch up on email and slack period and and I, I just don't i don't i don't waver on that at any stage and that's a very important point because it, it gives me a, a little bit of a, a stepping stone to, to to get stuff done it gives me a break and then i regularly put in two to four hour blocks of time for focus. I just put in my calendar focus time. Now I, I do routinely schedule people in for, for calls when there's stuff that's urgent, but I try as best I can to keep those, uh, those times available to actually do some sort of deep work, which you need to do from time to time. So I'd say from a leadership perspective, don't, um, don't get drunk on the need to show that you are ridiculously productive and that you're on, you know, eight hours of Zoom calls a day, five days a week. And but you, you're going to you're going to fry yourself. You're going to harm yourself and you're actually going to drag the productivity of your team down. Uh, so you need to be smart and build time in and lead properly, lead by example. Yeah. There's a couple of things in there that I'd like to unpack that I really like. I mean, one is this idea of more communication. And I think more communication, like you said, for some might mean, you know, lots of Zoom meetings or whatever. But I think really what we were trying to say is better communication, right? And, and we get to better communication through the other things that you were just describing, which is sort of organizational or, and again, intentional structure to your day and your life and all that stuff. And, you know, I, I mean, it's a, a well known problem in sort of remote work communities that people have a really hard time shutting off and they have a hard time putting up boundaries and, and these kinds of things. So if as a leader, you can, you know, model by example, that you, you know, have specific times for specific things, and we only hold certain kinds of meetings at certain times, yeah. and, you know, expectations are around who needs to attend or who needs to do what to prepare for that meeting, all those sorts of things being set out in advance, those different strategies, or I guess maybe tactics for how to be an, a good remote worker, you know, not only benefit you as the, the leader, but can, you know, trickle downhill and sort of lead by example, show these people how, you know, how to make a better situation for themselves, you know, and, uh, and so I think that's critical. Recognition of time zones. I mean, by virtue of, 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 of more companies being remote, um, there are going to be more time zones involved, significantly more time zones involved which means that from a leadership perspective, you need to be a little bit more cognizant of other people's time and recognizing that you can't and shouldn't impinge upon people's personal time. I, I, I have no problem whatsoever a couple of days a week when I do it with, with, with intention. Um, I will work uh, Eastern Standard, uh, work you know, a different day, basically five, I'll start five hours later and my time here in Ireland. And I'll do that from time to time, just so that I have a full day 
with the team that's based on the on, on, on the East Coast. But I, I do that because it actually helps me. And I do it to kind of reach, it's, it's sort of an olive branch as well. And it's to show that I'm, I'm participating. But, you know, it affords me the opportunity then to start my day at uh, 12 noon or 1 p.m. Now, I could be a little bit idiotic about it and get up at 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning and try to jam in five hours worth of work. Or I could do the smart thing and actually go and smell the roses, go and go out, you know, go, go walk the dog, go play golf, go for a bike ride. Um, that's the smart thing that you need to do is to actually build in some of those opportunities for you to, to do the smart thing. Another thing, another, we talked about communication. Um, there's a, not all communication is a meeting. Okay. Not all communication is sending an email. And I would urge people as well to, to recognize that different people learn different ways and different people take messaging different ways. And there are some teams where a quick three or four minute recorded video to a, a large team that can be sent out and watched asynchronously can be significantly more advantageous to a company than trying, you know, than waiting three weeks to get the right moment to get the half hour where you've got the folks in New Zealand and the folks in Ireland and the folks in Canada and you get them all to, no, no, no a very simple five or 10 minute, uh, well-recorded, well-scripted um, message from, from a leader or a group of leaders can actually be infinitely more impactful. And it just, and it also is, is a documentation of the record and it's something that people can go back to. So it's just a different form of communication. It's something we would never have done to, well, sorry, not never, we would, it's unlikely that we would have been comfortable doing it 18 months ago, but now we've become a lot more comfortable with it. So see the possibilities in actually advancing those levels of th those um, communication methods to get the most out of them. Yeah, well, and what I love about the idea of using video specifically is you can do so much more to head off sort of emotional problems that rise from misreading a text or misinterpreting uh, punctuation or, you know, whatever. And, uh, you know, I mean, you can take an email the wrong way, even if it's meant from a, a good spot where if you have a video, you're, you're layering on so many additional details, you know, the way you looked when you said it, you know, where were your eyebrows, you know, all this kind of stuff, you know, you can provide all these extra cues that I think make the communication just that much slicker. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, 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 uh, th there's so many different ways or so many new things that we're now getting used to that didn't really, that weren't part of our, um, weren't part of our structure, you know, uh, 18 months ago that we just need to, we need to be cognizant of, and we need to use them to our, to our best advantage. Like I'll be, I'll be really frank. I was not a user of quick video bites. I just, it just wasn't something that I was comfortable doing. Um, and I'm now much more comfortable doing it. It's not my absolute forte. It's not what I do first and foremost, but there's a time and a place where it works really, really well. Yeah. Yeah. And I've even seen some software solutions. Like I think it's called tandem is one of these. That's almost like an instant messaging type solution, but you can do it with video and, uh, you know, just sort of transcribe your instant video instead of sending a text. And, uh, and I just love it for that purpose. I, I think I'm probably a little bit more like you, like I, I don't mean into being on camera any more than I really have to be, <laughs> but, um, but I can definitely see how just being able to sort of say what you're thinking, uh, communicate what you mean, do all that stuff in one quick 30 second bite, rather than trying to be really articulate in your writing or something, you know, could, could not only be a, a time saver, but also maybe, you know, reduce headaches or, or problems in communication. Can I just raise one other thing as well? And I, I, I say this whimsically um, and not to denigrate anybody who's listening, but there are plenty of people complaining about, let's call it Zoom fatigue, all right? But I, let, let's, let's, let's just unpack that for a second. A year and a half ago, were people complaining about, oh, I've got meeting fatigue, I'm in the office, I've got meeting fatigue, or I've got people fatigue. No, they weren't. So why are they having Zoom fatigue, right? Or why are they do? And it's really a case of, I've come across some change. I'm not that comfortable with it. It was kind of forced on me. I'm not that comfortable with it. Um, this is a technology that I'm, I'm, I'm still becoming comfortable. I'm, I'm still not used to, so I'm not that comfortable with it. Um, 
so you you're, you you've got all these potential roadblocks as to why it's not that, why it's it's not that comfortable, and you find you're doing it for six, seven, eight hours a day. Um, and maybe one of the things that you that you've also begun to realize is that you're probably a whole lot better off and more productive with four to five hours of really deeply intentional meetings. And then, like I said earlier on, having blocks time where you can actually get your work done so that you don't end up complaining about Zoom fatigue. So when people talk about it, I actually start smiling because I think that's somebody who has not actually planned their day correctly and they're allowing other people. It's, it, to me, it's almost like people say, oh, I get too much, too much email. No, you haven't, you haven't learned to manage your email properly yet. So when people come and say to me, I've, got, oh, I've Zoom fatigue or I've video meeting fatigue, like, mm. maybe you're not saying no often enough. Maybe you're spending too much time. Maybe that one hour meeting should really be, could really have been a five minute um, video segment. Like we've just got to, we've got to think critically and do things in a little bit more productive manner. Yeah, no, I think that that's a great point. And actually, I mean, you know, back to the idea we were talking about earlier about just sort of, you know, remote work hygiene, you know, the ability to, uh, you know, manage your, your notifications and, and set boundaries. You know, I think that this is another one of those things, right, where if you're sloppy about it, and, and I think that, you know, just given how easy it is technology wise to allow people into our calendars and allow people into our whatever, um, it's very easy to sort of give up your freedom and feel like you're being pulled a thousand directions all the time. And so I don't know how much of the fatigue comes from the video call itself yep. versus how much just comes from sort of the mental, you know, stretch of being pulled from here to there to everywhere, you know, and being prepared to, you know, get online and talk and people are going to see your face. So you can't sit and scribble notes while you're talking. And, you know, I mean, like, I think there's a lot more to it than just the simple act of sitting on camera and talking. Yes. Somebody, somebody said recently, um, you know, don't, don't tell me what your priorities are. Show me your calendar and I'll tell you what your priorities are. <laughs> I, I, I challenge people to actually share their calendar with, uh, I mean, at Shopify, our, we have our calendars open so people can see you know, what, what, what we're doing. You can make it private if you want to, but I have mine at public. And it's a great opportunity for, for my team. Again, it goes back to the point of transparency and vulnerability. It's great for my direct reports um, to, and anybody to, to look and see what I'm doing. I mean, I've always got the opportunity to turn a meeting to, to private, but it's, it's, a, it's a way to show people what my priorities are. Now, could I do a better job? Of course I could. <laughs> but but uh, you know, at least I'm, I'm, I'm making an effort to be more transparent. And I love when people actually call me out on it and, and say, look, you know, I noticed you're spending a little bit more time on that. Is that really important? It's like, oh, I actually hadn't looked at it like that. Yeah, well, and what I like about it, too, is by being open and transparent with your schedule, for example, you give people the opportunity to respect your time, right? If, you're, if your calendar is closed to them and they have no idea what's going on, they're just going to set their meeting, right? They have no idea. Yeah. And maybe, you know, some meeting has to be prioritized and it is going to jump over top of something you've already got scheduled. I mean, sometimes these things will happen in a workplace for sure. But the idea is by being open and transparent, not only are you you know, being vulnerable and sharing your, your details so people can understand how you prioritize things. But you are giving them an opportunity to react to that and say, okay, well, I can see God, he's really busy every Tuesday. Okay, I'm not going to schedule things on Tuesdays, because I happen to know john is slammed on Tuesdays. So Wednesdays, though, that you know, he always has this block of time that nothing's going on. Okay, so every time I need him, we're going to hit him up on Wednesday. And I think it gives people, you know, back to this idea of intention, the opportunity to be more intentional on how they're working with you. Well, and different companies take uh, different approaches to to putting in blocks of time. I'll give you just a simple one from a Shopify perspective. And this predated the pandemic by probably two years. Uh, I think it was somewhere in the middle of 2017, a decision was made that um, people were spending too, mu too much time in meetings and they couldn't have possibly, they couldn't possibly be able to get, they couldn't possibly get their jobs done because they were in meetings so often that, um, uh, Wednesdays were deemed no meeting Wednesdays and suddenly we were encouraged slash forced to actually eliminate all meetings on Wednesday and Wednesday is the time when you actually put your head down and get some work done. Now some companies would consider that to be a little bit of a bizarre approach but I personally have found it to be incredibly helpful and it's when you actually that's when you sit down and write stuff that's when you start doing the strategic stuff it's when you start doing um, 
it start, it's when you start doing, uh, you know, career planning for your direct reports, when you actually sit down and intentionally look out the window and actually start thinking about the things that you should be doing. Um, so you, like, again, this is all manageable. It's just, we're in a different world and you need to kind of turn it upside down a few times, give it a shake and actually see what works best for yeah. you and for your company. Yeah, I think that's right. And, you know, as, as we're talking, it's occurring to me, you know, I, I mean, I think one of the things that happens with more transparency, more open, honest discussion, more, you know, vulnerability, all the things that we, we've been digging into is that we begin building better relationships with the people we work with. And it seems that this sort of vertical hierarchy that you think of in a traditional office environment, you know, where you've got your C-suite up here and your VPs and your whomever, uh, it seems to sort of level that playing field a little bit. You know, there still, I think, needs to be a little bit of built-in hierarchy, if, no, if for no other reason than understanding people's role in a company. But, um, but I think that, you know, the, it becomes maybe more of a really flat pyramid or something instead of this really high vertical tower. And I think that um, through the techniques we've been talking about, we can, we can foster better relationships. And one of the things that came up during the pandemic that has just had me scratching my head a little bit is trying to understand what the role of the employer is in sort of, I guess, the social well-being of our employee. So, you know, for example... You know, if I'm working for a remote uh, company and I have a boss who I am responsible to or whatever, like at what point do we draw the line between what the company should be providing in terms of our well-being versus what we should be doing for ourselves? And we talked a little bit about sort of some remote work hygiene and things like that, that, you know, where we can be maybe better about setting boundaries and things like this. But I wonder if you had some insights on just sort of whose role is it to make sure we're happy? Um. It's both really, it, it, it's both the employee and the employer. And I think it really is, it would be so uh, dangerous to say that it's absolutely the employer's responsibility or absolutely the employee's responsibility. Uh, you know, some simple examples. Uh, I would expect a good leader to, um, to ensure that their, their, team, their team members are taking enough vacation time, that they're taking enough rest, that they're actually log that they're not logging in at 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night on a consistent basis and, and burning out. So when you see that happening and you don't do anything about it, and you're then you're it becomes your responsibility. But it's just something that can be very easily nipped in the bud. Now, from an employee perspective, you gotta start off properly and what I've seen with companies that are intentionally remote, one of the things they talk about in new hire training is the ability to log on and log off and be very deliberate about that and set boundaries. And I think that's one of the things that will change from a learning perspective and from an onboarding perspective is that, log is that logging off at the end of the day and turning the laptop off is actually a very important step because if you think about it in days gone by you did your job at the office i mean anybody who says this isn't the case i you and i know they're lying they did the job in the office they took the laptop under their arm off they went home laptop opened up in the evening time and they were banging away on the laptop in the evening time and over time that's not a productive way to continue to operate and one of the one of the aspects that the pandemic has actually outed really is this whole concept of of um, never logging off. It really is a massively important thing because if you don't if you if you don't have time to actually log off, decompress, and relax, you are going to be a lesser version of yourself the following day. And I think so. So to, to go back to your question, whose responsibility is is it? It has to be both. It's the employee that they set out from the start to be a very productive employee, but to also know where the boundaries are and know that the company will respect you setting your boundaries. And then as a leader, when somebody is not able to self-regulate, that you encourage them, not regulate for them, but you encourage them to self-regulate in a better manner. Yeah, I love that. And, and to me too, it seems like this is a 
I don't know, pretty pivotal or, or like a huge shift in the way that leadership used to handle business, right? I mean, I come from an industry, advertising, marketing, where, you know, the pat on the back that you get is because you're the guy that worked the 24 hour shift overnight to make sure that the job got done, right? You got your rewards by being the guy that killed yourself. And, uh, you know, and, and I think, you know, as a, a guy who's largely been a freelancer most of my career, you know, it's really easy for me to just overwork myself, you know, get to the point where, you know, we come up on a deadline, sure thing, I can do it. And then, you know, over the course of three or four days, proceed to just make myself sick. And uh, so I really like what you're saying about the, I guess, the role of the employer being there to help people who can't self-regulate, regulate. And, uh, and I like that idea, but I, I like it as a helping hand, not as a, you know, I don't know, daddy state, <laughs> you know, right. like, we don't need somebody to actually be a caretaker for us, but I think it is important for companies to be cognizant and provide the tools to help people, you know, do this for themselves. Because I think most people, you know, want to give their all to their job. They want to be good. You know, I mean, most people aren't killing themselves for their job because they're not happy at work. You know, they're, they're doing it because they're trying to do the best work they can do. You know, but I think in those situations, it's a refreshing perspective, you know, especially coming from an employer, this idea that no, 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 you should take some time off. I recognize that you've hurt yourself or killed yourself for this, this particular task. You know what, why don't you just take tomorrow off, relax, you know, like, I think this whole concept even of, you know, from a leader's perspective, somebody, somebody, you know, suggesting that you should take some time off, I think is a new thing. I, I think you'll probably find and I'm just going to make up a fact here, but I, but I think you, you'll understand where I'm coming from here. It's my perception that, that uh, companies that are fully remote and are intentionally remote are far more likely to have a flexible vacation policy and a flexible time policy than companies that would have started out in an office-based environment. And that is because they've learned how to both regulate and self-regulate and get the right balance between the two. Like I know that I spend more of my time now in encouraging people to take vacation. I don't ever remember in an office-based world um, having to shoot people out to take vacation as much as I'm doing now. I, I, I'm, I find myself almost patrolling um, uh, my, my people's time to make sure that they're getting the same, getting the correct level of, um, of decompression time. Um, I, I feel more, I think it's more, it's more important to me now than it ever was before because I know that I'm gonna get a better version of, of that person when I can shoot them away for a couple of days, they get, they get a break and they come back. Um, so really it's a case of, it's, it's a case of getting people to, to, to not come to work for a couple of days and getting people to totally switch off. That's the other, that's the secondary issue. It's, let's not have the joke of somebody quote unquote not working and they're on Slack on their phone the whole time. That doesn't count. Right. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a really good point. You know, I'm just thinking of my own work history as we're sitting here talking and, and just thinking about how rigid people were around, you know, you get exactly X number of days. And, and, you know, if you take even an hour to go to a doctor's appointment, by God, you better log that hour and that needs to be you know, accounted for it. You know, it's funny. And it, and it seems that there's a much more progressive shift in leadership that these kinds of things, it's actually bearing out that the truth is you don't actually have to drive people so hard, like, you know, by backing off and giving them appropriate time for rest and all that kind of stuff, they're actually more productive and they're getting more done. And I think if you're working in a traditional environment where, you know, it's hours based and you, you just have to come in and, and log your eight hours or whatever, and that's how we're measuring your effectiveness is just that you were here for eight hours um, versus a model like, in, which is common in remote work, which is this idea of, you know, output based where we're actually just measuring you on what you got done. I think that shift is actually facilitating more opportunity for leaders to be more empathetic and to spend more time caring about the people they work with and recognizing, you know, God, you should take some time off. You haven't had, a, had any time off in two months or three months, you know, it's time for you to take a break. And I think there's some cultural norms to break. And I mean, I can only really speak for sort of, you know, American culture, but I mean, you know, here is a, it's a very driven culture, you know, you're rewarded for killing yourself. But I think that there is a, you know, a huge shift happening when you go to a, a version of work that is output driven and it becomes yeah. less important how much time you spent rather than how good is the, is the quality of your output. Can I burst one more balloon, if you don't mind? Absolutely. Um, 
And that is the, the, the concept of networking. Oh, remote work is never going to work because you're never going to be able to build up a network and know who's in, who's in your industry. Can I just tell you that in the 14 or 15 months since the pandemic has started, I have been on conference calls and webinars and podcasts with more people from more countries than ever before. I have widened my network considerably. I mean, significantly and considerably because uh, this world that we're in is, has less constraints than before, significantly less constraints. And anybody who tells you that, oh, you're not gonna be able to build a network if you're not back in an office. Look, there are industries and there are cities and there are jobs within cities, within industries that definitely do require you to have that level of networking. But there's a vast array of jobs that are act where you can actually explode the network that you're in and your industry uh, impact and your industry network from uh, the remote corner of Ireland. It's very easy to do. Again, if you sit down and make it a deliberate plan to do it, one of the things that I tend to do on a Sunday morning is I take out the, take the, this, the business section of the two main newspapers in Ireland, read through everything, and I literally, I'd say every single week, I would reach out to two or three different people that I see articles on, and I reach out to them on LinkedIn, and hey, interested in a, a virtual coffee to have a quick chat? And it is invigorating, it's interesting, it's exciting. Now, you know, I'm fortunate enough that I'm, I suppose I'm confident enough in 30 years working that I, um, people will see some value in having a, a chat with me, but I'm also out there, I'm out there to learn from people, to learn what's happening. So I'm continuing to network and I would encourage anybody and everybody to not accept that you can't network. What I'd, la what I'd ask people to look in the mirror and go, I haven't yet worked out how to network properly because there is a way to network and do it better than you probably ever have done it before. It might need you to either lean into somebody else and find out what they're doing or get out of your comfort zone and do it slightly differently or both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think, uh, I think you're right. I mean, I, I would speak, I mean, in my own experience, I mean, literally every job I've ever had, every contract I've ever won, every whatever has come by way of networking. It's come through somebody I knew who introduced me to somebody else. And then I was able to build a relationship with that individual that, you know, yielded some fruit in that sense. And not to say that all your networking has to be results-based. I mean, sometimes it can just be for the privilege of knowing somebody, but there really is, I mean, I mean, people are much, so much more uh, accessible now than they've ever been, you know, the author of your favorite book. I mean, you can reach out to them on, on LinkedIn or whatever, and, you know, maybe they won't respond. Maybe you won't get them, but you might. And, you know, the odds are getting pretty good. You know, a lot of times you can get a hold of people. I mean, you know, honestly, I mean, the way even you and I connected for this call, for example, I mean, this came through networking. I talked to guests in my first season and second season of the podcast that were like, oh, you got to talk to John. So I reach out to John and, you know, but I mean, this is how it goes. And I think that for, you know, career seekers and people who are working in remote positions now, I mean, doing the, the work now and meeting the people you meet now is what's going to make sure that you have a long-term, healthy, happy career. You know, if you, the, this idea or the old model where you used to stay in the same factory for 40 years or whatever is sort of gone. And I think that this idea that, you know, if you're not continually building a network up of good individuals, I mean, not only is your life not being as enriched as it could be because you're, you know, there's so many great people in the world to meet, but um, professionally and everything else, I mean, this is how business gets done, you know, as great as technology and everything else is, I mean, business gets done through networking. I'll give you an example. I would expect that there will be some people who listen to what I'm saying in this podcast and think I'm talking complete rubbish and some people who think that I'm making a ton of sense and whether which, whichever side of the fence you're on, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn and I'm quite comfortable and open to have a conversation. I'll have a virtual cup of coffee with anybody and everybody as long as it's interesting, thought provoking, and there's a learning opportunity for, for both people. Absolutely, I mean, why wouldn't you? Well, and that's the point, right? I mean, you never know where the right insight is going to come from or the right 
way of thinking about a particular issue. Maybe you're stumped at work and you'll hear the right thing over coffee that changes your whole paradigm or moves you into the right, you know, uh, right career path. If you're working somewhere or, you know, maybe give you the empathy to be a better leader because now you've heard somebody's story and it had a big, a big impact on you or whatever. I think that there's just so much that can become from, from that. And, and, you know, to just sort of bring it full circle, we talked about that a little bit at the beginning, you know, just sort of being open to learning and, and, you know, continually trying to grow as an individual, whether it's in a leadership capacity or a worker capacity or whatever, just this continual interest in becoming better or, you know, reinventing ourselves all the time, I think is, is a critical part of just being human, if, you know, not also a good idea for our professional lives. Absolutely. Totally agree. Well, cool. So John, we're at the end of the, uh, at the end of our hour. Uh, do you want to take a quick moment and just let people know how they can get in touch with you? You sort of mentioned LinkedIn might be yeah. a good way. Um, I will, and I'll give you a little bit of a caveat on it. Um, if you want to reach out to me and sell your company's products via LinkedIn, uh, you probably won't get a follow back from me. Um, but if you want to reach out for a conversation, absolutely. So I, I don't view LinkedIn as, I view LinkedIn as a networking tool, um, not a lazy salesperson tool, okay? And I, I, I don't mean to offend anybody who uses LinkedIn to, to build up their, their, um, uh, their prospects, but I, I don't, that's not how I operate. So I'm available on LinkedIn, easy to find John Reardon. You've got the spelling of the name in, in the, uh, in the, in the materials in the podcast. It's the easiest way to reach me. And I will take the conversation to email typically, um, fairly quickly. I don't particularly like keeping it in, uh, the LinkedIn messaging. Um, that's the easiest way to connect with me. And I love a thought provoking conversation. I love people telling me that I'm full of crap and I love people uh, challenging some of the stuff because you never know how wrong you are or how right, how right you are until you really have a good joust with somebody on a particular topic. So I love that. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a great thought, a great thought to close on. And I think also, you know, it, the way that you're handling LinkedIn, I think is probably the right way. I mean, not to get too preachy, but yeah, I mean, I too, I just, I get more of those, you know, automated messages that come over. And I think it sort of kills the purity of what LinkedIn was for a while, which was a great way to connect to one another. And now it's becoming sort of the sales platform. So it's a, it's unfortunate, but yeah, I agree. I mean, if people want to reach out to John, you know, do so with uh, the intent of just telling him how wrong he is. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I love it. Well, cool. Well, thank you so much, John. I really do appreciate you taking the time for this conversation. I mean, like I said, it's been, you know, a year in the making uh, between scheduling conflicts and things moving around and everything. So I, I couldn't be more happy to conclude our season than with this conversation. Thank you, Ryan. Sorry it took so long and hopefully we can do it again some stage in the future. Absolutely. Love it. And thanks so much to everybody who tunes into the podcast this week and every week. And we'll see you next season. I know. Oh, you everything.